more black socks. Uh huh. Cleveland Buck Eyes, you know it. Brooklyn Royal Giants, where they at? Cincinnati Tigers, bring them back. Birmingham Black Barons. Atlanta Black Crackers, keep you staring. Austin Black Senators. Baltimore Elite Giants. Birmingham Giants. Our next guest has got more good stories, and, and he's going to talk about this book. He is the editor of this book, The Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. Uh, and uh, his father was longtime Bison historian Joe Overfield, a good friend of mine. His 1985 book, The 100 Seasons of Buffalo Baseball, um, and this is in addition to it. It's an amazing book. He is a professor emeritus at the University of Vermont, and he joins us right now. Jim Overfield is with us. Jim, good evening. Thanks for hanging with us. It's good to be with you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, Happy to have you here. Wow. Um, Bob did a great job. Yeah, he is a tough act to follow. You got a guy, you, well, you got to follow him. You have no choice here, Jim. You got a guy I want to hear stories <laughs> yeah. about uh, who's a Hall of Famer. I confess, uh, until this past weekend when I was reading a little bit more of the book, I didn't know anything about this guy. Uh, Frank Grant in the 1880s, he's a member of the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, and he was involved in in the color line that was established in baseball, right? Absolutely. Yeah, um, Frank Grant is one of uh, 21 players who wore the Bison's uniform, who uh, now is in the Hall of Fame, and he was elected in, in 2006. His is an interesting story, and one that sheds a lot of light on the, the plight of black ball players back in the closing years of the uh, of the 1800s. Um, Ulysses Frank Grant is shown here in a uh, picture when he was uh, a member of the Bisons for a black player to be shown with uh, his white teammates was a bone of contention for many of these clubs. Uh, photographs of this type were boycotted by other players in the league. And in fact, uh, had quite an impact on, uh, on later developments. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Frank Grant's life. He was born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in August of uh, 1865, just a few months after his namesake, uh, General Ulysses, Ulysses Grant accepted Robert E. Lee's surrender in Virginia. Uh, he, uh, he and his family, it was a big family. He was the youngest of nine children, moved from Pittsfield to Williamstown, Massachusetts at some point, And they lived very close to Williams College, which was the uh, alma mater of the uh, current owner of the Buffalo Bisons, Bob Rich Jr. Uh, he learned to play baseball with uh, white kids for the most part who lived in Williamstown and uh, he played on his first team uh, with the uh, Pittsfield Greylocks who competed uh, with other regional, re early regional teams of that, of that size and skill level. Uh, in uh, 1885, he moved a little bit farther north and he played for a semi-pro team that called themselves the Plattsburgh Nameless. Yeah, you heard that right. Their nickname was the Plattsburgh Nameless, which I've got to believe is the worst uh, <laughs> nickname that any <laughs> baseball team is. There's some bad ones out there now, had. Jim. <laughs> yeah, I agree. They've gotten kind of uh, kind of out of control. A big moment for Frank Grant, and quite frankly, a big moment for the history of blacks and organized baseball, took place in 1886, when at the age of 20. He signed to play professionally for a team that operated in Meridian, Connecticut, and was a member of the uh, Eastern League. Now, the Eastern League is a pretty big league, uh, had some big, big urban based franchises. Newark was a member, Jersey City had a team. Meridian was barely above the level of a village. I think there were about 16,000 people who lived there when the silver, uh, silver men, as they were called, began to play, but uh, so they folded uh, midway through the season. And it was at that point that the manager of the Buffalo Bisons of the International Association signed Frank Grant and two of his white colleagues to a franchise to play for the uh, 
the Bisons team. Frank uh, continued to play for the Bisons for two more seasons. In 1889, he uh, left the club uh, under a cloud of some controversy and joined the uh, Cuban Giants. There's a picture of Frank in a Cuban Giants uniform. From that point on, uh, he was a member of the Cuban Giants or some other all black baseball club. He played for, uh, for a time for the uh, a team that called themselves the Cuban X Giants. He played for the uh, Big Gorums, which was named after a tavern in uh, New York City. He played for the genuine uh, Cuban Giants and ended his career playing for the Phil Philadelphia Giants. He left the, the, the Giants team in uh, 1908 and uh, really was never heard of again. He uh, apparently moved to uh, New York City, didn't have anything, uh, any connections with, uh, with the game, uh, made a living as a, a waiter uh, at various different uh, restaurants and uh, died in obscurity. Jim, uh, you write about Frank Grant in the book, The Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you write that he faced persistent racial hostility. In fact, he, he played second base. He had to wear wooden shin guards. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Uh, let me backtrack just a little bit. Um, and we'll talk about the shin guards issue, uh, shin guards <laughs> issue shortly. But uh, 1886 was uh, a really key year um, in, uh, for black ball players. Uh, Grand signs with the Bisons, uh, another excellent black player, a pitcher by the name of George Stovey, who up to that point had played for the uh, Cuban Giants, was purchased by Jersey City, which was a competitor uh, the Bisons had in the, uh, in the uh, um, in, in, the, in the league. Uh, so in 1886, there were two African-Americans signed to play professional baseball. And as it turned out, both of them had star seasons in that first year. Um, Grant led the Bisons in hitting, uh, stolen bases. Uh, he was a crack fielder. Stovey, uh, the pitcher that was signed with Jersey City, um, gosh, he had a earned run average, uh, something around 1.31. Uh, he had 203 strikeouts. One game he struck out 22 batters. So they were both stars. And this kind of uh, made some general managers, well, there were, were general managers back then. It made some managers and owners think about what about these black ball players? Sure enough, in 1887, there were four clubs in the um, International Association that carried black players on their rosters. Uh, Frank Grant played in Buffalo. Uh, there were two players who played for, uh, two black players who played for Newark, one of whom was George Stovey, who had been kind of stolen away from uh, Jersey City. Uh, two played for Binghamton and two played for Syracuse. So there were seven players uh, who were playing professionally on integrated uh, all white teams. And uh, they had a lot of problems. There's no question about it. And there was a lot of resistance uh, to their presence. I think generally speaking, they were greeted very positively by their hometown fans. I know Frank Grant was uh, routinely described in, by the, in the Buffalo papers as a fan favorite and uh, much loved uh, uh, various descriptors of that type. On the other hand, uh, when these black players are on the road, they often uh, encounter, encountered uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hostility. There was one uh, notorious episode that took place when the Bisons were playing in Toronto, where the Toronto fans, whenever 
of Grant came to bat or whenever he made a play in the field and he was a spectacular fielder uh, using um, a racial epithet that's not really mentionable on uh, this evening, but shot it, uh, killed the Negro, killed the Negro uh, as loud as they possibly could. The newspapers for the most part uh, were, gave these ball players a fair deal. I think they praised their accomplishments and criticized them when they made mistakes, but there was no particular racial bias that's detectable in the ways that they reported the games. The biggest problem these black ball players faced in 1887 were the white ball players. Or they, they experienced on their own team and faced on the other team. And it was uh, notorious that uh, Grant, a uh, second baseman, did have to experience with uh, primitive wooden shin guards to protect him from the ball players who perfected the art of spiking him as they tried to steal second base. The black players, when they were at bat, routinely were thrown at. White pitchers, when their battery mate was a black catcher, uh, were known to throw balls intentionally in the dirt so that they were uncatchable and perhaps capable of hurting their teammate who was a, uh, who was a catcher. There was one notorious instance in, again in, in Canada where uh, Frank Grant, who was famous for the quickness of his release on um, double plays, uh, there was a Hamilton player who crashed into him intentionally to break up the double play, knocked Grant on the ground. And when Grant jumped up in anger, Grant was immediately attacked by a number of other Hamilton players who, according to the Buffalo News, actually tore his britches off in the scuffle. And as far as we know, not a single Bison player intervened. Now, Grant did have a couple friends on the Bison's Club. Uh, in fact, in 1887, one of, the Bison, one of the Bison's players, John Reedy, served as the best man in Frank Grant's wedding, which took place in Washington, DC in 1887, just before the onset of the 1887 season. And you can find him here, John Reedy, a Buffalo, Buffalonian. Reedy uh, stuck, with, stuck with the club for another couple of years, uh, stayed on in Buffalo and played an important role in uh, local Buffalo amateur baseball. Uh, but we know, learned nothing more about his possible friendship with Frank Grant. We also know that in the March of 87 and 88, Grant trained together with a number of other Bisons as they got together for the, uh, for the upcoming season. 1887, I already mentioned that um, there were um, efforts to hurt the black players. Um, there were examples of name calling that were uh, very distasteful, but the biggest threat to their status was the actual, what amounted to a player's revolt on the part of white players about having to play alongside uh, these black athletes. Uh, it, in June of 1887, the Binghamton Bingos, nine players, uh, sent a telegram to their owners saying that they would no longer play any ball games as long as the Bingos had two black players on their roster. Uh, the white players ultimately backed down and continued to play, but both the black players and the Binghamton team were released uh, before um, in early July and their careers were ended. In Syracuse, players refused to sit for the team photo that was taken, that was planned for that year. Uh, 
two two players, both from Southern states, uh, spearheaded that. Uh, quite a few of the other uh, Syracuse players uh, said they would go along with it. Um, there seemed to be what amounted to a white players revolt against having to play side by side or against uh, the seven players who had started out the season. And in fact, the situation reached the point that finally a special meeting of the International League was held in Buffalo, New York uh, in July of 1887. And the decision was made to, by the vote was taken uh, to instruct the league secretary to no longer accept any contracts for black ball players. The ball players who were still in the league could stay for another year, but after that, there would no, be no more. The color line uh, was an unspoken law in most of, uh, for most baseball clubs and most baseball leagues. The International Association, which later became the International League, uh, actually did draw a color line um, by that vote in, um, in 1887. So there were seven black players in the International League in 1887. Uh, in 1888, Frank Grant, two other players decided to uh, sign on for that extra year. Um, so there were three in 1988, but in, at the end of the 1988 season, uh, Grant signed with the Cuban Giants, uh, an all black team. And so did, uh, and another uh, player just quit and went home. Uh, he no longer could stand the, uh, the pressures of being a black, black athlete at that point. And uh, in 1889, there was one more black player still playing for Syracuse. But after that, there were no more black players in the International League, nor would there be until 1946, when uh, Jackie Robinson debuted with the, uh, with the Montreal Royals. So uh, Buffalo, um, although it had a, minor, a major league team for only a relatively small number of years, played a very important role in, buff, in baseball history. And the uh, vote that was taken by the International Association, as it was called, in uh, 1884 is one of those, uh, is one of those landmarks. Uh, there were other uh, ball players who were closely tied and connected with the city of Buffalo a uh, player who's not very well known at all is a uh, man by the name of Grant Home Run Johnson, uh, who played for uh, many of the uh, all black clubs till he settled in Buffalo in 1913 and stayed there for the rest of his life. And Howard Henry, who also on our panel tonight has, will have something to say about, about him. But, uh, Grant's quite, Grant is quite a story. He was a great ball player. He's a great fielder, uh, a, a great hitter, uh, a small man, 5'7", 155 pounds, still could hit home runs, although I think many of his home runs that are credited to, the, to him must have been of the inside the park, uh, inside the park variety. And uh, it's a wonderful uh, story that finally in 2006, uh, this pioneer appearing pioneering ball player who went through a lot uh, to stay in the game uh, was recognized uh, by being installed in Cooperstown in uh, 2006. Maybe it's Howard's turn to talk uh, about Home Run Johnson. Baseball historian Howard Henry, the author and founder of Friends of Buffalo <laughs> Baseball History. Howard, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and um, well, first of all, I want to get your thoughts on Luke Easter. I know you have something to say about Luke Easter's role in uh, popularizing Buffalo. At the time, I think he came in when it was community ownership, right? He was he was sort of key in, in making that team successful in the uh, mid to late 50s, right? You are definitely right. He was the first player that the Bison signed 
on October 17, 1955, to play for the Buffalo Bisons. He was a legend. He was a huge black man with a huge white smile and huge home runs and a heart that was even bigger than that. And so that's what made him such a fan favorite in Buffalo and helped bring people to the club when it was struggling as uh, a 56 community owned baseball team. Um, Luke Easter hit a home run in 1957. He actually hit two of them over the center field scoreboard in Buffalo Stadium, which was 400 feet from home plate. Here's the stadium right here and <laughs> 60 feet high. And the dotted line you see is a ball hit by Joe Caffey, also African-American player for the 56, 57 Bisons who uh, won $1,000 by hitting that sign. The owner of um, the uh, hockey team uh, claimed that he would give $1,000 to anybody who hit the sign, and Joe Caffey did that. <laughs> but I would like to hear what Bob Kendrick has to say about Luke Easter, because we're talking about black baseball here, and he's hanging around because he's got some stories about Luke Easter. I will tell you, before I go for the moment, that Larry Doby is not forgotten in this house. There you go. <laughs> Larry Doby, my favorite ball player until 1956 when Luke Easter came to town. Well, you know, Luke had, I would call the unenviable task of following Josh Gibson. When the Grays signed Luke Easter, they signed Luke Easter to take Josh Gibson's roster place because Josh is really sick now. And for folks who don't know, Josh was suffering from a brain tumor. And, and he knew that he had the brain tumor, but refused to have surgery because, as you can well imagine, guys, he was afraid that he was going to be left in a vegetative state. And so they ultimately, when Gibson is just so sick, you know, and he eventually succumbs to the brain tumor by way of stroke, January 20th, 1947, just a few months before Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier. So the Homestead Grays signed Luke Easter to take Josh Gibson's roster place. And, and of course, you know, it, you know, there's no way you can live up to, jo to Josh Gibson. But I tell you what, Luke Easter more than acquitted himself, you know, trying to step into those enormous shoes. He had a great season with the Homestead Grays, and, and that would ultimately lead him to the opportunity to be signed by the Cleveland Indians and to go on. And, you know, it's a shame that Luke never really got a fair shake, you know, because you talked about how well-liked he was. He put up huge numbers virtually in every stop he made, and, and he just really never got a fair shake. Now, to be honest, we don't really know how old Luke really was. <laughs> <laughs> but I know all I know was he was leaving a lot of Easter eggs, as he called them, yeah. all over the place. But yeah, he, he had the task of filling the shoes, the enormous shoes of one Joshua Gibson. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I want to ask you, Howard, one more question about Luke Easter before we move on from him. But as good as, as a player he was, he was regarded as an amazing person, right? there. You and, and Jim write about the thousands of people who attended his funeral after his tragic death in Cleveland. He was, he was revered almost by fans, not just in Buffalo either, Rochester as well, huh? Yes, he's a member of the Buffalo Bison Baseball Hall of Fame and the Rochester Red Wing Hall of Fame. Uh, the Bisons got Luke because he was too kind to children in 1955. He was playing <laughs> with the Charleston, South Carolina Senators. He was giving baseballs away to the kids in the stands at the end of the game. So the Senators uh, suspended him for several games and gave the Bisons a chance to sign him. He did the same thing in Buffalo, and he did it for three and a, three and a fraction years until the Bisons just had to let him go. And John Stiglmeyer, who was the general manager, 
said it was the toughest decision he'd ever had to make in baseball. Uh, Luke was also a, a person who went to the Michigan Street YMCA, which was a local black gathering place where a lot of culture took place. And it was there that he was also a mentor to children. So he was a man who reached out to the community, but black kids and white kids loved this guy. And so did a lot of adults, regardless of color. Luke, before he, he signed with the Homestead Grays, um, he had a lot of bad luck. Um, he was uh, played with a, uh, an all-black team out of St. Louis called the St. Louis Titanium Giants. Mm -hmm. uh, signed with them in 36 and continued to play with them up until 1941. 1941, he's driving in a car with Sam Jethro, one of his teammates, who later plays for the Boston Braves. Braves cracks the car. Luke uh, breaks his leg. He can't play any more baseball in 1941. 1942, World War II starts. Luke is drafted in 42. Uh, he's on active duty for over a year. And he's mustered out. He's given an honorable discharge for medical reasons. Goes to Chicago, works in a chemical plant, defense-related chemical plant, until 1945. This means for five years, he never played a game of baseball. He never swung a bat. He never put on a ball glove. In 46, he joins the uh, Cincinnati Crescents, a barnstorming team organized by Abe Saperstein, the uh, owner of the uh, founder of the Harlem Globetrotters. And you can see Luke right here. This is a picture of the team in Honolulu, Hawaii. The Crescents literally barnstormed all the way from New York City <laughs> to Honolulu <laughs> to Puerto Rico. And they played all year. Uh, and Easter put up phenomenal numbers. He had 74 runs, he had 200 RBIs, he batted 425. And it was that year which set the stage for his move to the Homestead Grays, which mm -hmm. in turn, yeah, there he is, Luke. I mean, he's a giant of a man. This yep. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes, he was. Uh, his stint with the Homestead Grays leads him to uh, be signed by Bill Beck, who in turn was responding to a request from the general manager of San Diego, who called up Bill. He was the parent club of San Diego and said, hey, I need a big Need a big right-handed power hitter to fill out the lineup. Well, Beck uh, didn't know that Luke was a left-hander, uh, although his power alley was more to left center than, than right field. So uh, he sends Luke to San Diego, and uh, uh, Luke becomes a second ball player, um, second black ball player to play in the uh, in the Pacific Coast League. So a lot of the stuff is inter interconnected. Yep. Howard and Henry, I want to get you talking about a guy that you've researched and written about, Home Run Johnson, who uh, uh, came, you know, what, in the 1910s, I guess. Uh, and he was a player, a good player, right? But he really was a mentor and maybe in some ways helped found the uh, Negro Leagues in, in 1920, right? Just by his mentorship of several African-American players. Um, I don't think he was involved in that effort. He had made an effort back in 19. 09 when he was uh, captain of the Brooklyn uh, Giants to get a, a, a Negro League started then. That had to wait really until 1920 and Bud Foster. But uh, Grant Johnson came here, here to Buffalo about 1914 or 15. After 20 years of top flight play um, in the highest of the Negro Leagues, barnstorming leagues, um, at least captain or manager for seven championship teams during that time. The premier shortstop of his era in black baseball, and had he had the chance, if you listen to Bob Kendrick, you know why he did not have a chance to play in the white leagues. He should be in the uh, National Baseball Hall of Fame right now. There you see a picture of Pete Hill on the left, outfielder, Grant Johnson on the right, shortstop with the Philadelphia Giants. 
Uh, Pete Hill is in the Hall of Fame. He got grandfathered in in 2006. Grant Johnson was considered, but didn't make it. Here's uh, the Findlay uh, Ball Club, Findlay Sluggers, of Findlay, Ohio, where Johnson was born. He hit a reported 60 home runs, and that's how he got his uh, run, yeah. nickname. Yeah. That's a close-up shot of him. Um, he was a line drive hitter. He was a Henry Aaron hitter, not a Bay Ruth hitter. So uh, he came to Buffalo at the end of his top flight days, and we were graced with his presence here from 1915. And I have him in uniform in 1933 when he was 60 years old. Here's the baseball diamond in Delaware Park, diamond number two, where on June 24th, 1917, Grant Johnson and John Emery played on an integrated baseball team. They played with the Phoebe Snows, a, a railroad team, because they worked for the Phoebe Snows. They played against the Oakdales. It was against, it was against the unwritten, quote, gentleman's agreement that blacks and whites would not play on the same team. So a man named Thomas Mercer, who was the head of the um, league, the municipal league, said, we are not going to stop these black players from playing because they are members of the railroad team. Unfortunately, the owners changed uh, the rules the next day, not explicitly preventing blacks from playing, but everybody got the message. Here's Mr. Johnson uh, all dressed up because he had a wonderful baritone voice. And he was a founder of a choral society in Buffalo. He, he sang with several choral groups. He was a mentor to young men. They called him dad. Huh. People would come from around the country to play with the Pittsburgh colored stars of Buffalo just so that they could play for Grant Johnson. This man belongs in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He well, Howard, should have maybe... been there long ago. He should have been there in 2006. Grant Johnson was buried in a pauper's grave. I put together a group of people, the um, Friends of Buffalo Baseball History, the Negro Leagues Baseball um, Monument Project, uh, Gary Ashwell from Seamheads, the Forest Lawn Association. We bought a headstone for Mr. Johnson. And I found his grave site. I found his de date of death. We put a, a gravestone on his grave. It's a sunken grave, meaning there was no casket. We put a road sign next to it so you can see it. It's in Lakeside Cemetery in Hamburg, New York. Um, this was well, a good man. Howard, mm -hmm. we thank you very much. And we're going to get together soon after this. And I think we can put together a campaign. I know Eric Brady wrote a great article for buffalonews.com about home run Johnson, but we're going to put a, together a campaign from Buffalo to get him into uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, but for some other great stories of Buffalo baseball, Murph? Yeah, we have another baseball historian. Our, our next guest is the assistant editor of this book, The Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. He's the man behind the website, The Herd Chronicles. And believe it or not, he has seen the uh, the Bisons this year as the Trenton Thunder. He made a trip to Trenton, New Jersey to watch the uh, Trenton Thunder. Uh, Brian Frank joins us. Brian, what was it like seeing the uh, pseudo Bisons, the Ersatz Bisons, play in, in different uniforms in Trenton, New Jersey? It was great. You know, I didn't realize how weird it was to see them wearing Trenton Thunder jerseys until I was there seeing it. Um, <laughs> but it was really great to be able to see them play this year and um, got to see. It. By the way, breaking news from Ken Rosenthal: Alec Manoa was called up to the Blue, or is uh -huh. going to be called up for the Blue Jays to make his next start against the Yankees. So well, at we'll least see him here in, in a couple of weeks. Huh? Out. Yeah, well, he was still a Bison. So yeah. Hey, um, we want to talk to you about what you've been doing research-wise. He, Brian, is a baseball historian, and you, you know, Major League Baseball made the announcement in December of 2020 about incorporating all the Negro Leagues uh, statistics and and biographies and backgrounds and major league records. You're doing research on that era, right? Including, what did you find? 30 Negro League games uh, having been played in Buffalo over the years? Yeah, I've been uh, researching uh, Negro League games for a while now. And then when Major League Baseball made that announcement, I kind of zeroed in on that time period from 
1920 to 1948. And uh, the only way to really do it is look through the microfilm uh, at the library and go through like day by day of the newspapers. And um, I think we're up to close close to 40 now. Okay. Uh, um, there, there were lots more games in Buffalo, but many of them are obviously exhibition games. But games between teams from like the Negro American League and, and Negro National League were up to about 40. And I've been in contact with uh, seam heads who have put together a, a tremendous um, Negro League database and they're working with Major League Baseball to try to identify uh, which games will be classified as Major League to make sure that um, any games that I find will be documented and hopefully stats will count. Uh, one of the biggest problems with doing it is that the local media coverage at the time wasn't that great for the Negro League games. Uh, the Buffalo News and Curry Express would both advertise uh, the games coming up and then usually they would report the score and maybe like a sentence or two or three about the game, maybe say like the home runs that were hit or pitchers that pitched. So the, the holy grail that you're kind of looking for is a box score um, to document who played and, and the statistics from the game, but those are really hard to come by. Usually you just kind of get a brief summary. Um, so it's, it's kind of very frustrating research because you end up at a lot of dead ends. You don't get what you're looking for with the box score, but it's also really rewarding um, when you find a, a, you know, a big team or a big player that played here in Buffalo. With Brian, with that in mind, um, how are they going to incorporate Negro League statistics with uh, Major League Baseball stats? I mean, how accurate will they be in general, not just Buffalo games? What do you think? Well, that's a great question. Um, I was actually in contact with John Thorne, the official uh, Major League Baseball historian, and some of the guys from Seam Heads in the last few weeks. And I, I don't really think MLB has like clearly defined um, how they're going to decide like which games count. Um, for example, if a, if say a Negro American League team played a Negro National League team in Buffalo, would that count or did it, did the game have to count in the standings or does there have to be a box score? You know, if, if the paper reports to say Josh Gibson hit a home run in Buffalo, that's great. But if there's no box score, will that, you know, do you have to sort of get a couple papers to say it or can, so mm -hmm. they haven't really clearly defined how they're going to. Um, find the statistics yet, but uh, Seamheads is a great website with great historians working for it, and they're working on that now, trying to build up as many as they can. Baseball historian Brian Frank is with us. You, you've written and talked a little bit about uh, this player. Uh, everybody knows Jackie Robinson played here for the Montreal Royals in 1946, and he played, what, a total of nine games, and he even stole home in a game at Offerman Stadium. You're right about that, huh? Yeah, he did. That, that's kind of the thing that really stands out to me. Um, he played nine games here in Buffalo with those 46 Royals. He went 11 for 29, hit 379 here. He had four stolen bases and stole home right, right here at Offerman Stadium. When I think of Jackie Robinson, one of the first images that comes to my head is, is what we're looking at right here, him stealing home yeah. um, in game one of the 1955 World Series and uh, Yogi Berra putting a tag on him. When you look at that picture, I mean, that's baseball right there, right? They wrote a song about it, Brian. He stole home, right? I mean, it's in the song. And and Yogi Berra, though, swore to, to his dying day that he was out, that he got the <laughs> tag on him. So, but, but yeah, he stole home right here. It was, it was actually the fourth time that season that Jackie Robinson stole home in the 1946 season, but mm -hmm. he stole home right at Offerman Stadium. So it's, it's pretty cool to, to think that that happened here. You know what else I like that you wrote about how he was, I think they had a double header. The Montreal Royals were playing here against the Bisons, Offerman Stadium. And in between games of a double header, he, they actually honored him, right? The folks in Buffalo had a, like a ceremony to honor Jackie Robinson, correct? Yeah, they did. Um, the chairman of the common council the, from Buffalo and some other prominent citizens spoke and, uh, and gave him gifts and stuff. And um, between between games of the double header. So they did, it was a big deal that he was here. The papers were sure. covering it and, and it was a big deal in the city. And one thing I wanna ask you about, you do a lot of research, you're a historian, you were assistant editor of this book, obviously the seasons of Buffalo baseball. I understand you're, you're working on another book about the Toronto Blue Jays, right? Yeah, I am. Um, I was 
with the Blue Jays in Buffalo, I was really fortunate uh, last year to, to have press credentials and be able to go um, to just about every game and, and participate in the press conferences before the game and after the game. So I've been trying my best to, to document all that as a historian and I'll be doing it again this year. And, and hopefully when, uh, when the Blue Jays are done here, I'll kind of have the complete record of everything that happened and, and put in a book for the folks of Western New York to enjoy. Uh, Brian, what is your prediction of uh, how long will they be here this season? You know, it, it's really hard to tell. I mean, uh, if you, I, I think if you asked me that question tomorrow, I'd probably have a different, different answer than today. Um, they've been doing a great job up in Canada recently of getting the first vaccinations in people. They're actually over 50% now for, for their first vaccination. So, I mean, it, it's hard to say. It could, could be as early, they could go back to Toronto as early as mid-July, or it could be much longer than that right through the end of the season. I'm going to play the ultimate politician. I'm going to say I wish they could open the border so the cottage goers could go to their cottage and people could go shopping, but fans cannot go into the Rogers Center and the Blue Jays have to stay here for the summer <laughs> and into the playoffs and World Series. World Series, yeah, there you go. You split the difference there. There you go. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian Mike. Frank, assistant uh, editor of the Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. We've got a bona fide Buffalo baseball former player with us now. He played three years of Major League Baseball with the uh, Pirates and the Tigers. Uh, first round, or not a first round, but a draft pick in 1979 of the Dodgers. And he was a Bison pitcher from 88 through uh, 90. You may have heard him earlier on singing the National Anthem. We won't ask Morris Mann to do that for us right now. But Morris, thanks for coming on here with us tonight. We appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey Mo, um, as you were coming up in the game, what did you did you realize or did you experience uh, racism as a black ball player coming up from South Carolina, and then you were drafted by the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers in '79, and then began your career in uh, in professional baseball? Definitely, um, you know, it's more outside of baseball, but um, you know, when you're young and you're uh, we were in Vero Beach at the time, and uh, I was in first year in A ball and looking for a place to stay. And uh, my room, well, my buddy was, uh, he's a white guy, and he went to talk to somebody and said, uh, We're looking for a place to stay. And they go, Yeah, we got plenty of places for you guys to stay. So the next day I went with them to sign the lease, and all of a sudden they don't have any place to stay. So that kind of stuff mm -hmm. was going on. Plus, you know, we were in. Daytona Beach of all places, and man, you talking about culture shock. I actually saw a sign that said uh, "No Blacks Allowed," and this was in the '80s. And I, I couldn't believe that, but you know, little stories like that, man. My first year in Detroit, uh, we're in uh, out near Eight Mile, and I'm staying in an apartment with a guy named Jim Wellwonder, and one of my one of my uh, one of my um, teammates invited me to dinner because I didn't have my wife with me and he had his wife and children with him. He said, man, listen, why don't you just come up and uh, have dinner with us this Sunday afternoon? We play earlier. So I walk from our apartment to, uh, to his house, have dinner with him. And I walk back and Jim Wellwonder meets me at the door said, man, somebody called the police on you saying that there's a, a guy that's not belonging in this neighborhood walking in the neighborhood. So stuff like that happens. Um, and, and we have to help our young people understand that uh, these kind of things are going to happen. And here's how you should react to it. So, Well, Morris, so, that's a perfect segue. And Mark, if we could bring in our next guest in a side screen of uh, Willie Hutch Jones. Uh, Mo, you've talked to Willie. Um, yes. One of the things to our viewers is when we publish this book, The Seasons of Buffalo Baseball, that you could uh, obtain through Amazon, through the Buffalo News uh, store, bisons.com, right here at uh, Dave and Adam's uh, Card World on Sheridan Drive in Williamsville, and a whole bunch of other places, and the book is available uh, uh, for sale, and we're going to give one away to a lucky uh, viewer at the end of the show here, but... Jim Overfield was very adamant that we do something for the legacy of his dad in honor of this book, using some of the, a portion of the proceeds. And 
we're talking about maybe getting some uniforms for uh, uh, the PAL or helping out some youth teams. And ironically, it was a year ago today when um, the horrible uh, murder in Minneapolis happened. And a few days after that, I saw a pastor on t television saying that what the inner city youth need is vision, hope, and mentoring. And I do some volunteer work with Omega Mentoring, Cedric Holloway, and I called them and said, could we create the uh, Joseph Overfield Memor Memorial Baseball and Mentoring Program? And he said, absolutely, but you got to go through Willie Hutch to do the sports program. And I'm just happy to have here a, a, a all-star MVP basketball player um, who was uh, – a division one player at Vanderbilt went on to the LA Lakers, then played over in Europe. But most important about him is that he came back to his hometown of Buffalo and for 37 years has been running the Willie Hutch Jones uh, education and sports program. Hutch, welcome to the show. And tell us a little bit about uh, the Willie Hutch Jones program. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Morris, how you doing, man? It's good seeing you again. Everything's good, Willie. What's up, baby? Hey, just, just getting things done. I appreciate our conversation that we had some time ago. Uh, yep. You know, putting a lot of things up here into motion. I appreciate having, uh, it's, it's important to have mentors. Uh, good evening to everybody out there. Uh, John, you sitting back all cool. Appreciate you, John. Uh, it's good to see you out there. And of course, uh, with an introduction that I'm, um, Mike gives it. He basically tells your whole story. I'm, I'm just more of a, I'm more of a humble guy. Uh, you know, hey, Mike, John was he he was uh, in our programs years ago yeah. when he was out there dunking and shooting layups and everything oh, yeah. back in the day. You know, yeah. he even had his boys around. You know, I so my boys. You know, that's right. Every right. I, I, we yeah. we were right there on East Ferry Street, right yeah. there at the, yeah. at the park there. You know, yep. so I, I do remember, and I, I humbly thank you for helping us continue to grow. This organization now has been around three decades, and our major thing is that we want to give young people guidance. Uh, we want to give them basic skills so that they can go on and compete at different levels, whether it's in any sport. Baseball, yes, we would love to revive it. You know, all of a sudden, it seemed like it just disappeared over the years, and, you know, you notice that the diamonds are even gone, so... You know, when you start taking away basic things for young people, then they just kind of float to like baby basketball and football. But, you know, there's there's other so many other things that our young people can get into. And our organization is, is one of those organizations that tries to provide free programming for children here in the Western New York area. Um, Hutch, real quickly, yes. talk about on that board behind you, it said chess. Talk about how chess came into play if I joined your program and I wanted to get a basketball, what would you oh, tell me? You, you, you want me to go back to that story when we were doing the chess program down at the old first ward center. I know where you're going yeah. with that one. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was funny. Um, we had an after-school program going down there at the, um, what was the name of that center down there? The old first ward center right there down there. And uh, it was funny because all the kids wanted to really get into the gymnasium, but before they had to get into the gymnasium, they had to actually... Uh, go and play some chess, maybe a half hour or so as a lead up. And, you know, uh, young kids don't realize that everything you do in life is really on a chessboard, some type of way. You just have to translate it mentally and uh, in the strategic aspect. But the kids, they would play chess for maybe a half hour or so and then bounce and get to going to the gym. As time went on, kids start deferring the gym because they've got into chess. And, and, and eventually no one really went into the gym and played anymore because they all got into the chess. And some of those kids, we actually sent to Chicago for a chess tournament later on. But that's just the thing. Our young people don't know the, the, the certain things out there that they can have and ex be exposed to that can actually help them until they actually try it. It's kind of like, you remember, I don't know, how, a lot of you guys on here can remember that commercial about Mikey. Remember, it was a, a commercial where Mikey had some cereal and it was like, try it, you like it? And uh, Mikey, he was like, no, Mikey doesn't eat anything. But once he took a teaspoon of that cereal, man, his brother couldn't get it away from Mikey. 
And that's the <laughs> kind of thing what we got to do. You know, in the Willie Hutch Jones organization, what we try to do is expose people, especially disadvantaged people, you know, to opportunities so that they could become, you know, possibly fill, you know, shoes of mine, you know, as a former NBA player, a graduate of Vanderbilt University, right out of here, you know, grew up across the street from Canisius College. So, you know, Mike, you know, that's, that's our mission. And our key thing is we do it for free because, you know, when you start to charge people, some people may have it, but others who really maybe need those services, you know, they don't have it. So, you know, that's why we, you know, we break off, we, as you see in the background, we got steam, dance, chess, team talk, you know, volleyball, soccer, golf. You know, we're, we're doing the whole gamut. And you have the Cameron and Jade Baird Foundation supporting you. You have the Ralph C. Wilson Foundation supporting you. You have Uniland. You have so many sponsors that are helping because you help people. But right. you mentioned earlier word mentor when we talked about uh, Morris Madden. Morris is a lot like you in Charlotte, North Carolina. He heads a youth baseball program, the Carolinas Metro, which has become his passion, helping ki kids succeed in life. However, I'm sure he reminds them what he heard from his dad and wife in 1985, don't quit. Back then, Morris was in the seventh year of a professional ball player, and he was only at the double A level. And he looked in the mirror and he said, you know, where am I going? I can't do this anymore. And he called his dad up, called his wife up and said, I quit. And they both told him, you, you can't quit. You, you've never quit before. Don't quit now. Just hang in there and see what happens. Two years later, he walked into the clubhouse in Detroit and out pitching for the Detroit Tigers a couple of years after that, after coming through Buffalo and opening up pilot field and getting used to playing in front of uh, full houses that were cheering on his every pitch. He then went to Pittsburgh and pitched for the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. So Mo, we thank you for going back home and teaching the kids and we want to emulate your program. Talk a little bit about what you do for the youth in North Carolina. The biggest thing for us, and I do have one of my coaches here in the office with me, and I do have another coach online with me, Mr. Fred Wright. But the biggest thing for us right now is that we're catering to inner city kids from the ages of four to 18. And what we do is uh, we get them into our reading program starting pre-K to up to the sixth grade to make sure that our kids are reading on grade level. And once they get out of, out of uh, the sixth grade and the seventh grade, we start them in our junior senior transition program, uh, which uh, they work. They have workshops every fourth Saturday of the month. Um, we do uh, SAT training, ACT training, um, uh, any tutors that any tutoring that they're needing, uh, go college visits and all that good stuff. So we're playing a lot of baseball down here. Uh, but we're not here to make uh, major league players. We're here to make major league citizens, man. And that's the biggest thing with us. Uh, we operate out of a $7 million facility. It started out as a $300,000 facelift, but now it's a $7 million facility and we're grinding every day to get that paid for our kids. So we're putting it out there, man. I hope sometime you guys can come down here and see what we're doing. <coughs> Actually, I'm hoping to come to Buffalo too to see what you're doing. So I know that uh, uh, I talked to Willie a little bit about it, and Mike, I know we talked about it a little bit, but before I, before I get off, I, mean, I can't go without saying that, you know, we, we've been blessed to have a lot of people pitch in. And if you can see, I think some of you guys can see Mr. Fred Wright, who was online with me here. Fred was a, a major league scout for about 30 plus years. And he is, uh, he is uh, has jumped in our program with both feet. Um, we have Tony Womack helping us out. We had other than left yesterday, we had over 100 years of professional baseball service on the field wow. with us at one time. So, those are the types of things we're doing. We're trying to, and Bob, I don't know if Bob is off yet, but we're going to uh, take a team to Kansas City this year so that our kids can experience uh, the Negro League Hall of Fame and understand what it's all about, what we're doing with that. Hutch, we're going to leave it to you for the parting words. John and Mike, uh, man, this thing is great that you guys are doing, man. Just the key to things is exposure. You know, we got to expose people and 
you know, it, it's great to let people know about the Negro League. Because as I was, when I grew up, I, I really didn't know anything. You know, I heard of a guy, Satchel Page, and, you know, you didn't really know about too many other things. But social media and all of these other things, this is great to know because if somebody sees something and that means they can achieve it. You know, I was just, I was out shooting before I threw the shirt and tie on for this. I was out in the driveway shooting with my little guy. And he was like, dad, man, you're trimming me. I'm like, that's right, man. I got, I got over 30 years in this thing, buddy. And you only got three at the most, you know what I'm saying? So I said, don't get discouraged. No, don't get discouraged. You just got to put your time in. That's all you got to do. Don't, you know, let's keep this thing going. When I get off of this Zoom, I'm pulling this thing back off and we're going to shoot some more. But you're not going to beat me no time soon, buddy. I want you well, to understand well, Hutch, that. Hutch, you got to follow uh, my wife, Debbie. You, you, you're one of your dearest friends. Her favorite line is, you must visualize what you want to realize. There you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, Jim Overfield, if we could bring Jim back up for the final remarks. I'd just like to... Uh... Thank everybody, boy. It's been a great night. There's a lot going on uh, in terms of the city of Buffalo. Just inspiring to see programs that we just heard uh, described. And my dad, I think, uh, would be very, very pleased to know that at least some of the uh, proceeds from the sale of, of our book will go to support programs like this. And uh, Thanks, John, for serving as the MC. Hope you have a good time calling the Bills games this fall. And uh, of course, thanks to Mike, uh, to Howard, and to uh, Brian for uh, pitching in. It's been a fun night. And uh, as I said, very grateful to everybody for helping out. Thank you very much, Jim. Good night, Murph. Thank you, Mike. And congratulations to you and Jim Overfield and Brian and Howard and everybody who put this together. The book is uh, The Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. Um, it, where can you get it? Well, you can get it virtually anywhere. Well, there you go, buffalonewstore.com if you'd like a copy. Uh, the Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. It Basically, every almost everything we talked about tonight is in the book and more, much more. So well, Murph, congratulations how about, on the book. How about tomorrow morning, come right here to uh, Dave and Adams right on Sheridan Drive at Transit. Opens at 11. Unbelievable. What, what did you see, Murph, walking around? Uh, I saw a lot of stuff I would definitely accept as a gift. Murph wants that. <laughs> Murph wants that. Ar there's an Archie Manning helmet autograph. Oh, Miss. Archie Manning. Unbelievable. I saw, I saw that over there. It was great. And there was a little bit of Josh Allen in here. There's a lot, a lot of Josh Allen. Yes. And a lot of baseball. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, stay tuned. And uh, hopefully we'll have uh, part three, uh, maybe when the... Uh, this base 2021 baseball season is over. We'll feature uh, Brian Frank talking about uh, the Blue Jays in Buffalo. Thank you, and God bless, and God bless America. The Baltimore Black Sox, uh huh. Cleveland Buck, as you know it. Brooklyn Royal Giants, where they at? Cincinnati Tigers, bring them back. Birmingham Black Barons. Atlanta Black Crackers, keep you staring. Austin Black Senators. Baltimore Elite Giants, Birmingham Giants, New York Black Yankees, Dayton Marcos, Memphis Red Sox, New York Cubans, Newark Eagles too, Indianapolis ABCs, Kansas City Monarchs, Cleveland Cubs, Cleveland Bears, Detroit Stars, Jacksonville Red Caps, let's keep them in